Well, if you're going to get all quiet, we'll go ahead and... We're glad to have you here this morning and uh, glad to have you worship the Lord together. Uh, brave the weather out there. And so we assume that we probably have a few more joining us there online. And so we're glad to have them. And, and if you're joining us online, take the opportunity to uh, say hello. Let us know there. Uh, but I think a great opportunity to come and to worship the Lord together this morning, and we're grateful for that. Uh, had a different verse planned as our call to worship this morning, but as I got up and looked out the window, I thought this would be an appropriate one for us to share this morning. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, Come now, and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as wool. Though they are red like crimson, uh, so that they are red like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And what a blessing that is for us to be able to gather together and to worship the God who forgives and cleanses sin. And uh, we have the opportunity to experience the forgiveness of our guilt, the forgiveness of our shame, uh, and to experience the cleansing that comes from God. And we're grateful for that. And because of that, let's take the opportunity to worship Him this morning. This morning, let's start off with You Are My All in All. You are my strength when I am weak. You are my treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus. Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb. Ancient words. Holy words long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words Impart. Words of life, words of hope, give us strength, help us cope. In this world, where we roam, ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true. Changing me and changing you, we have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Holy words of our faith, handed down to this age, came to us through sacrifice oh heed the faithful words of Christ holy words long preserved for our walk in this world they 
may resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Then heaven came down. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, he met the needs of my heart. Shout is dispelling with joy, I'm telling he made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sin were washed away and my night was turned to day heaven came down and glory filled my soul born of the spirit with life from above into God's family divine Justified fully through Calvary's love, oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made, when as a sinner I came. Took of the offer of grace he did proffer, he saved me, oh, praise his dear name. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Now I have a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure there in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believe Riches eternal and blessings supernal From His precious hand I receive Heaven came down and glory filled my soul When at the cross the Savior made me whole My sins were washed away my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. That's how Miss Christie has a special this morning. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. The Lord has surely blessed me, and I am so glad to be here with all my church friends and family. Uh, I have been through a lot of things this last two or three weeks. Uh, my family's had COVID, and uh, they've come through it with God's help. 
wonderfully, no problems whatsoever. My brother had a heart attack and had to have two stents put in. He's up running around just like normal now. And uh, my ex-husband had uh, bleeding from his cancer treatments and stuff, but they uh, have stabilized him and there's no more bleeding and stuff. God has truly been wonderful to my family and I am so thankful. Wonderful, 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 isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? Wonderful, 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 isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? I have seen and I have heard and it's recorded in God's word that Jesus my Lord is wonderful. He made the blind man to see and he died upon the tree. Oh yes, Jesus my Lord is wonderful. He raised a child from the dead. He taught the sinners where to tread. Yes, Jesus, my Lord, is wonderful. He changed the water into wine. He gave the world many signs. And Jesus, my Lord, is wonderful. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? Wonderful, 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 wonderful. Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? I have seen and I have heard and it's recorded in God's work. And Jesus, my Lord, is wonderful. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? Wonderful, 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 wonderful. Oh, yes, Jesus, my Lord, is wonderful. And he so is. Thank you. That's why we're gathered here today to take the opportunity to worship and praise Him this morning. If you have your Bibles, we're turning to Acts chapter uh, 2. Just go ahead and hold your place there this morning. Uh, this morning is uh, Sanctity of Life Sunday, and it's the day that we take the opportunity to remember uh, there to kind of to pray and to fight for uh, those, uh, the unborn, and not just the unborn, but also uh, just the value of life. We understand that as uh, humans, that we're created in the image of God, that we've been given there from God, value by our Creator. And so every life is a life that is worth fighting for. And so when we come to a day like Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, we want to take the opportunity uh, to remember that, to advocate, to pray for that. And, and so uh, certainly as we look at that this morning, we're going to take the opportunity to pray for it. I want to uh, encourage you to continue to pray for I can keep praying for it until uh, abortion is done and gone away with completely, both uh, there through the legal means, uh, but also that there's no longer a need there for that. Uh, pray there for the value of human life both after uh, birth as well. As we talk about sanctity of human life days, that we're talking about their uh, euthanasia and values of that. We're talking about valuing uh, people, regardless of skin color, nationalities, uh, that, that all human life is endowed with value from God. And so I want to encourage you to continue to pray for that. I want to encourage you to continue to advocate for that. Uh, I was uh, blessed the other day. We, we, I think I was driving through Bloomington, and, and uh, there at the Planned Parenthood in Bloomington, there was people gathered outside to pray for uh, their, uh, for. Uh, those that were inside to pray for the, the pro-life movement, I would encourage you to advocate to get involved uh, where the opportunity there is. Uh, take the opportunity to vote. I, I believe that uh, morals and values are some of the most important things, even more important than our economic uh, uh, kind of condition and our pocketbook. So uh, when they say that people vote with their pocketbook, I hope that Christians are different than that, that Christians instead vote with their conscience and with their values first. 
uh, and then we look at economic uh, opportunities and reasons second. We realize that oftentimes those two go together, uh, but as Christians and believers, we should vote our conscience there. I, I want to encourage you there. The third part there is to, uh, so the fourth part, I guess that would be, is to get involved and do something. Until the time that abortion is done away with, uh, we want to advocate and get involved and support those. And so one of the ways we have the opportunity to do that is you have that uh, little flyer there, hopefully right next to the seat of you. And uh, if you don't have one, you can reach over and steal one from somebody else or we can make sure you get one of those before you go. But uh, here in our Local area here in Bedford, we have the opportunity to support uh, Hope. Hope Resource Center, a pro-life advocacy there that uh, provides uh, ultrasounds uh, there for pregnant mothers, uh, supplies support and encouragement, counseling, uh, uh, provides after-birth uh, support for the young mothers to help them there with diapers and clothing and whatever needs they have, as well as to help with parenting classes. Uh, and so one of the, the if we truly believe that the pro-life movement is important, then we can act upon that and support hope. And so I'd encourage you to, to do what you can there. Uh, get involved uh, there as well. And so we want to kind of just take the opportunity just have this as a call to action this morning. Is even as we uh, kind of we're going to go into Acts chapter 2 and study that, but we want to have that call to action to support life there this morning. So with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord, we Know that life is a gift from you, that you knew us in the womb before we were even born, that you have created each one of us individual and unique, and that comes there from the sovereign hand of a good God. God, as you know each of us there in the womb, may we advocate for the value of life. May we encourage it in a culture that is increasingly enamored with death. Lord, may we... Uh, advocate for life and understanding that all life comes from God, that God is both the giver and the taker of life that belongs exclusively there in the hand of God. And so, God, we pray that you would uh, be with those, uh, those mothers right now that may be contemplating, that are afraid and scared and uh, unsure of what to do. Lord, we pray that you'd bring along somebody who is a good godly influence that would encourage and influence and support them to choose life. Lord, we pray there for our legislators as they contemplate these issues, that you would move to work in their conscience, that they would choose that which is righteous and good, and that we'd move to advocate to the uh, making illegal their abortions and all that would take away the life that you have created there. And God, we pray that you would move and work in our hearts so that we would... Uh, not just talk about it, but that we would move and act, whether it, it's coming alongside of people like Hope Resource Center. We thank you for their ministry. We ask that you'd continue to bless their ministry uh, and be with them. Help them to uh, continue to influence young uh, mothers and fathers there for the cause of life. Lord, we uh, pray that you'd support their work. We pray that you'd help us come alongside just not only to pray for them and support them, but we'd support them financially and uh, emotionally and encourage we stand up and advocate for them and that God that you'd help us there to to make a difference in this corner of the world that you have placed us with these people that you have surrounded us with and that God that we'd be a light and salt influence here where we are and then Lord we pray for those even after life we uh, pray for Houston Condell Lord that you just be with him and his body and his health that you'd just touch and be with him and his wife and that you bring them back to health we think of some others who are not able to be here because of health concerns God we pray that you would be with them we know that you're the giver of life and that you value all life and so Lord we thank you for that pray you be with us now as you open up your word it's in Jesus name that we pray amen, amen. if you have your Bibles let's go to uh, Acts chapter 2 uh, is where we're going to be going, and we're going to be taking the opportunity to look there at Pentecost. And the Pentecost, we know, uh, was influential there in the church. Matter of fact, I, I would be one of those that would advocate that Pentecost is the beginning of the church. The church begins at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit is given. Uh, when I was studying for ministry, I had the privilege of uh, doing an internship there in Eastern Tennessee in a little town called Oliver Springs. Now, uh, Oliver Springs wasn't kind of it's one of those blips on the map that you blink and you miss it. It wasn't a very large town. But the next town largest to us, if you want to go to the restaurant and go to the store, uh, you would go to Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And if you've ever been to Oak Ridge, Tennessee, you know Oak Ridge, Tennessee has a, a very interesting history. Uh, prior to World War II, Oak Ridge, Tennessee did not exist. It was just a beautiful open space there in the Tennessee mountains, surrounded by forest and mountains. Uh, a beautiful place to go. But in World War II... 
uh, they needed a place where they could do research that was private, uh, that could be kind of secluded there. Uh, and so they settled on Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And what uh, caused Oak Ridge, Tennessee, literally overnight, that town went from being zero to about three to 4,000 people. And what caused that kind of almost overnight uh, was there, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, was part of the Manhattan Project. Uh, in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, you'll find a nuclear reactor, a smaller nuclear reactor compared to some of the ones that we have today that they use for uh, research now. It's a research facility there in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, but they built that nuclear reactor as a part of the Manhattan Project. And if you remember there towards the end of World War II, what brought about the end of World War II uh, was there the atomic bomb. The Manhattan Project was tasked with developing and building the atomic bomb and learning how to release the power of the atom. Since that time, splitting the atom has been one of the most powerful uh, sources of energy that we know of. We know that the destructive elements that was seen both there at the end of World War II in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, we've seen the productive elements of it, right? Uh, if you go to a nuclear power plant that can produce large amounts of energy and uh, there to, to power cities and states, and, and we've seen the productive uh, part of it there. So oftentimes when we think of energy, we think that one of the most powerful influences in the world is nuclear energy. But when we come to Acts chapter 2, we understand and realize this, that there is something even far greater than nuclear energy, and that's the power of the Holy Spirit. When we look at the impact the Holy Spirit has made in the lives of individuals, in the life of the church, uh, in taking this group, this small group in there in Jerusalem, and there through the ministry of the Holy Spirit was able to explode that uh, ministry of the gospel to within uh, just a few short years, it was influencing and changing the Roman Empire. Rome began to uh, view the church as a threat, even with all of their mighty military force. Uh, and then within a, a few short years after that, actually eclipses the Roman Empire and is greater than the Roman Empire. What could cause that difference? We understand that difference is caused by the person of the Holy Spirit. And that's where we come to Acts chapter 2 today. We've got a, a lot of the ground that we're going to cover, so we're going to kind of cover it there part by part. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to start there by going verses 1 through 4, uh, and then we'll kind of work our way there through the passage. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were with one accord in one place, and they were all... And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues, as it were uh, tongues of fire. One sat on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. As we look at this, we see the first part as we're studying there at the Pentecost, that the Holy Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost. And it helps us to understand a little bit kind of of what's going on. So uh, usually within the church, when we talk about Pentecost, we understand that this will be the day uh, that the Holy Spirit was given. And we, we know the signs that accompany it, the, the mighty rushing wind, the cloves of fire, the, they go out and they speak in tongues, and there's a great uh, conversion. There are people there that day. Um, but it helps to understand what exactly Pentecost is. And Pentecost is, if you look at that, it was a Jewish feast that, that particularly celebrated the wheat harvest that came in that was 50 days after Passover. Now, we understand that Jesus Christ was crucified uh, the day before Passover. Uh, and so, uh, penti meaning 50, 50 days after Passover, they would celebrate together Pentecost. And so, it was a Jewish feast. It was one of the three Jewish feasts that you were uh, to come back to Jerusalem, there to the temple, and to celebrate there together. So there, the temple uh, would be filled with people. The city of Jerusalem would be filled with people that had come back to Jerusalem, there to the temple, there to worship. Not only uh, do we see that it was uh, filled with those who were local residents there of Judea and the, the surrounding areas such as Galilee and Samaria, uh, the faithful of Jews, uh, we know that there were several pilgrims. And, and as we'll learn, there's people that have Jews that were dispersed all throughout the Mediterranean world. And they would now want to come back here to Pentecost to celebrate this feast there at Pentecost. And so it's 50 days after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. We've experienced the resurrection. Jesus Christ had taught there for 40 days. He's then ascended into heaven. 
And for the last 10 days, they've been having this prayer meeting where they've been waiting in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came. As we kind of mentioned, we don't know if they knew exactly what they were waiting for. They were just praying and seeking God's face. They were doing God's business. But for the majority of the time, they were praying together there in the upper room as one body, as it says here, in one accord. There on the day of Pentecost, as they were gathered together, they experienced the signs, the dramatic signs that demonstrate the Holy Spirit was given, right? Uh, Suddenly there came from heaven as the rushing of a mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, or the sound of a rushing wind. Uh, We would uh, kind of relate that there to a tornado, right? And somebody who's experienced a tornado, and I'm grateful that I've never experienced one of those, but I understand from sometimes some of those people that have experienced them will say, you know, it sounds like a freight train Uh, It it just sounds like this huge rushing wind. And apparently this sound of the rushing wind was heard throughout all the city of Jerusalem. It it wasn't just there in the upper room, but it was all throughout the city of Jerusalem. They could hear this sound of the rushing wind. And so they're gathered together, they're praying, and then all of a sudden the dramatic sound of the wind begins to sound. And I'm sure that that kind of a a hush began, and they began to kind of say, kind of what's going on? And and uh, 120 people began kind of paying attention. They were waiting there with anticipation. It's interesting as we look at some of these uh, signs that were given, uh, the sound of the rushing wind, not long after that, as they were gathered together, there appeared over each of those that were inside the upper room, cloven tongues of fire. The idea of cloven just means that the, the tongues of fire were kind of split into two, similar to what the the picture that we're using for our background. And these began to rest or reside over all of those that were there in the room. It was a visible manifestation or sign that the Holy Spirit was given. So they had the sound of the wind. They had the visible manifestation of the fire. That reminds us there of John chapter 3, verse 8, right? Where uh, Jesus is saying the blend, wind blows wherever it listeth. And so the same is with the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that he convicts. He, he's moving just like the wind. Or or maybe you might think there in Exodus, uh, sorry, not Exodus, Ezekiel chapter 37. And Ezekiel chapter 37 uh, is commanded to prophesy to the valley of the dry bones. You remember the old song we we used to sing, you know, the hip bone connected to the the leg bone. And I don't don't even know that song very well. Uh, But we'd sing that song and it comes from Ezekiel's visions of the dry bones. And it's about the nation of Israel that is uh, dead. Uh, They're they're those skeletons. and, And it's just a Huge valley of bones that are dry together. And all of a sudden, Ezekiel prophesies of this valley of bones. And there begins to be movement. And the bones begin to kind of join together. And, and all of a sudden, skeletons begin to stand. And then, not long after that, there begins to be flesh and muscles that begin to come over them. But there's one thing that's still missing, right? What's that? There's no life. There's bodies, but no life. Until, in ex- Ezekiel 37, there the wind blows across and we understand that the wind there is the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, those dry bones come back to life. The same is true with us. When we experience the gift and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, is when we experience salvation, the Holy Spirit brings us back to life, gives us spiritual life. It's that picture of the fire in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, there that our God is a consuming fire. And so it was the visible manifestation of the signs that the Holy Spirit was given that resulted then in a transformation in the individuals. But it also reminds us here, and this is the good news for us, that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Every one of them there were filled with the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19, right, that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, uh, that we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. So this was where the Holy Spirit was given to the church, to everyone that were gathered together there in the upper room that had believed and trusted in Jesus Christ. They were witnesses of His resurrection. They uh, followed Him as they now had experienced His salvation. They were given the gift of the Holy Spirit, and everyone there in that upper room experienced there the Holy Spirit. It's a change in the ministry of the Holy Spirit as we learned from before. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was given, but He would come upon those believers for the sake of ministry, Uh, And at times then could leave them. If you remember David, uh, after he was rebuked of his sin, said, Don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. We 
have the experience of the change in ministry in that Christians now are given the gift of the Holy Spirit and they are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. So the good news is this, is the moment that you trust Jesus Christ as Savior, you're indwelt with the Holy Spirit. We don't have the Pentecostal experience. We don't uh, seek this. We understand that this is a one-time event in history that this happened. Uh, and so we don't have you know, long prayer meetings that we're waiting for the sound of the mighty rushing wind. And, and we're, That was a one-time event. It doesn't get repeated. So we don't need to seek that type of Pentecostal fire. But what we do have and what we are blessed with is that we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit who can empower us uh, for ministry, can work His change, bring it about in our life. And so we have that gift of the Holy Spirit here today. And as we'll look at this, uh, when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll notice this, that there was a change in their words, right? They began to go out and change in what they were speaking. There was a change in their character, in the way that they acted, uh, and there was a power to serve Jesus Christ. And, and as you study Acts chapter 2, that's what you begin to see. And I believe the Holy Spirit still does the same thing for us today. Right? When we uh, surrender to the Holy Spirit, we get a change in our speech and the way that we speak. We get a change in the character. If He begins to move and to change our character, we experience the sanctification that comes from the Holy Spirit. And there's a power to serve, an ability that is beyond our ability to do that. So that's what begins to happen. And so... The Holy Spirit is given. As the Holy Spirit is given, what they each experience is the speaking of tongues. In verse 4, in this, uh, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with whole tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So let's keep going there. And they were there dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. They were all amazed and marveled and looked at one another saying, Look, are these not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear them in our own languages in which we are born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and those dwelling in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and uh, Asia, uh, Thygria and Pamphylia and Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining, uh, adjoining Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and and proselytes, Cretans, and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. And so they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What could this mean? But others mocking said, Oh, they're full of new wine. Uh, and so what we have here is the second sign that we want to kind of just focus a little bit on is this idea of speaking in tongues as a sign for the Jews. Here at Pentecost, as the Holy Spirit is given, they have the sound of the rushing wind that not only do those inside experience, but everyone inside the city experiences. They have the cloven tongues of fire that those who are inside begin to witness and to see residing over each of those as a visible manifestation of the Holy Spirit was given. And then as a result of the Holy Spirit being given, all of them began to speak with tongues. And apparently what they did is they left the upper room they began to go out into the crowd, and the crowd was gathered. We uh, assume the crowd was gathered because they heard the sound of the mighty rushing wind. So, you know, you hear the tornado go through uh, in a kind of a closed city like Jerusalem. All of a sudden, everybody kind of goes, what's going on? Like, you know, the, the fire trucks begin to go down the street. Everybody kind of pokes their head out and say, oh, I think it's time to go for a walk. Let's go see where the fire trucks are heading out. And, and uh, the, the crowd begins to gather with this sound of the mighty rushing wind. So whether they left from there and went into the temple complex or whether they kind of went out into the streets and, and the streets began to fill with people as to say, we heard something, something's going on, what is it, what's going on? Uh, and they began to speak. and They began to speak with tongues. As we look at this, those who are gathered, because at this time in Jerusalem, uh, there are Jews gathered from all over the Mediterranean. They're here for the specific purpose to celebrate Passover. Uh, not Passover, sorry, Pentecost. Uh, oftentimes, for many of the Jews, this was a, a once-in-a-lifetime pilgrimage. We understand uh, they're after uh, both the Babylonian captivity and after the Assyrian captivity. Jews were taken out of the land of Israel and were dispersed all throughout uh, Babylon and throughout kind of all the known world. Uh, then you remember when Cyrus gives the decree that they can come back to Jerusalem, not all the Jews came back to Jerusalem. Some of them had, after 70 years of being in captivity or the dispersion, sometimes you've heard that term, the diaspora, 
uh, they found out there's good economic opportunities out there. So they began to go into different areas seeking economic opportunity uh, there. But they still retained their Jewish identity. So even though they may have been living in a place like Rome, they were still Jews. They were still faithful followers of God. And so uh, while it wasn't feasible for them to come back for every Passover and every Pentecost, they had a desire that once, you know, maybe once in a lifetime, they'd save enough of their shekels together. They were going to make this pilgrimage uh, there to celebrate Pentecost. And uh, if you could time it right, you'd come for Passover and you could stay for Pentecost and, and you could kind of... And so there's a, a whole bunch of these folks that are all from outside. of the, They're not long-term residents of Jerusalem, but they're in Jerusalem for the moment, particularly to celebrate Pentecost. Uh, their first language is not Hebrew or Aramaic. Hebrew is the language of the Jews. Aramaic was the language that was often spoken. It's similar to, there to Hebrew. Uh, there, it wasn't even Greek. Greek was the trade language of the day. Uh, and so... Some of them, it wasn't their Greek wasn't the language, and then Latin would have been the official language of the Roman government. Um, you'll notice they're saying, we're speaking these in what we'd call heart languages. These are the first languages that we learn, right, that we speak. And so if you took Spanish in high school, right, you understand that you may be able to speak Spanish, but if you're going to give the preference, uh, you're going to speak whatever was in your home. And so for most of us, that's probably English. We're, we're really comfortable with that. We can usually spot somebody whose first language is not English, just so the the way that they speak. And so they're coming out and they're speaking in all of their heart languages. And they're saying, how is this possible? Uh, they, don't, they don't know our languages. These are just unlearned Galileans, right? Galilean is that backwater place. There are a bunch of hicks and rednecks from over there in Galilee. And you've got all these hicks and rednecks that are speaking perfect dialect. I mean, they're on point. How is that possible? When you look at this map, you'll understand their... Uh, where they all came from, right? It, it, that kind of just shows you all throughout the Mediterranean world, all the way uh, there from as far away as Rome, uh, there to Elam or to the Persian Empire, over on the other side to Cyrene, there the tip of Africa, as well as Egypt in Africa. Uh, they all came there to speak the languages they had. It points us out to this fact, right? From the very beginning, the Holy Spirit's intention was to take the gospel to all nations. Now, we understand right at this time, these are, are Jews. They're Jews and they're proselytes. Uh, but when, if we understand that if God only wanted one nation to do it, he would have preferred their language and kept it in their language. But because he shares it with all of these languages, he's showing that God has a desire for all people to come to know Jesus Christ, the Savior. The gospel is not for a select few, for us right here in Bedford, Indiana, that we're going to keep this to ourselves because we've got some good news. It's not just for white people that, you know, all English-speaking white people get the opportunity, the privilege of hearing the gospel. The gospel is for all people, regardless of nationality, regardless of skin color, regardless of language. And the Holy Spirit points this out all the way here from the beginning. He shares the gospel. You'll notice, right, this is, right, the reversal of Babel. You go to the Tower of Babel back there in Genesis chapter 11. That's what we have. When you come here to, to Pentecost, what we experience is this, is under the Holy Spirit's power, the disciples speak in languages they had not previously learned. Uh, so of these 120 disciples, we assume that were gathered together in the upper room, uh, there wasn't a group over here like, oh, we've learned Latin really well. So we, we're going to take the Latin group, and there's another group over here saying, oh, no, no, we've, we've learned Farsi, we're Persian really well. We're going to go over here, and we'll speak all the... No, uh, they were Galileans, they were Jews, they may have spoke uh, Aramaic, maybe they spoke Greek. Uh, some of them may have knew a smattering of, of Latin because they've had to interact with the Roman soldiers. Uh, but all of a sudden, they're speaking now in languages they had never learned. This is a supernatural work of God. This is what the gift of tongues are, right? This is uh, some confusion in the church today is what is the gift of tongues? Is it a, a supernatural prayer language that nobody understands that so we kind of just speak to God in this prayer language? We don't well, when we come here to Acts chapter 2, we see the description and the definition of tongues. We understand it's a language that is understood by someone. That when the Holy Spirit gives this gift, it's for the purpose of communicating a known thought to someone there. Uh, it's not just, a, a, you know, look at me, how important and spiritual I am. It's so that we can communicate who Jesus Christ is, right? What do they say? Uh, there in verse 11. 
we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. They understood what the disciples were speaking, and the disciples were speaking this. And so here we have this gift of tongues that are given. They very simply are just languages that were not learned before, that the Holy Spirit supernaturally enables them to speak. And so as they're gathered together, most there in the crowd, especially those who are foreigners in the crowd, are kind of standing there with uh, you know, open mouths like, wow, what, what's going on? Like, this is amazing. How is this happening? They, they don't know this. They've certainly not learned the dialect well enough. You know, I mean, like, they're saying it perfectly with the, the right intonation and the right speaking. How is this possible? Uh, but then there's other groups like, oh, so this is nothing. These guys are just drunk. I don't know what they're saying. They're just you know, kind of gibberish over there it's because of the, they're, you know, they must have been hitting the bottle a little bit too hard this morning. Um, and Peter kind of speaks and rebukes that there. In verse 14, Peter stands up uh, there in the crowd. And we understand that this is possibly in the temple precincts because that would be about the, the area that is large enough to hold this large of a crowd. Uh, we know there are 3,000 plus in the the reason we say there's 3,000 plus because when we get to the end of this sermon and he gives the invitation, 3,000 people trust Jesus Christ as Savior and get baptized that day. If we're following kind of the norms, we understand that there must be more than that because oftentimes even when the Holy Spirit is moving, there's people uh, that are slow to respond to the gospel or maybe are resisting the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so there's 10,000 plus and Peter finds a prominent place, gets up, and begins to preach there in verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known unto you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day, the third hour being nine o'clock in the morning. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. It's unusual that anybody would be drunk, even those that were drunks wouldn't usually be drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning. But this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons, your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. And on your men servants and your maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. And I'll show you wonders heaven above and signs on the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke, and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great uh, and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God by miracles and wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I for saw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, that you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known unto me the ways of life, and you will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you. Of the patriarch David that is both dead and buried, that his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh that he would be raised up Christ and set on his throne, he, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul will not be left in Hades, nor would his flesh eat corruption. And Jesus, this Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from him the prom, uh, from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured this out, which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies my, your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know us surely that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. 
We have here the first Christian sermon uh, here given by Peter. And I, we, a lot there in this sermon that we'd really like to take the opportunity to kind of to dig into. And I want to encourage you to dig into it a little bit more probably uh, there at home. But let me kind of just give you some of the highlights there of this sermon. You'll notice uh, that Peter uses an introduction. And the introduction that Peter uses is there the speaking of tongues. Matter of fact, he didn't even create the introduction uh, the Holy Spirit created this introduction. He just keyed off the introduction. They're all speaking in tongues. People are saying, what's going on? Others are saying, look, they're drunk. And uh, Peter says, look, guys, let me share with you what's going on. You're seeing this phenomena. Let me share with what this phenomena is. And then you'll notice very quickly what he does, right, is he goes from the introduction into the Scripture. Joel chapter 2, verse 28, and following there. Uh, and he begins to share there from the Scripture that this is what was prophesied by the prophet Joel, that I will pour out my Spirit upon your young men and your young women. They will prophesy and speak with tongues or, um, or see visions. Um, and this is an evidence of that. This is that prophecy fulfilled here in your midst. Uh, he's pointing out this fact that this the speaking of tongues was a sign for the Jews that they would understand and know that the Holy Spirit was given. And then he goes on to his points, right? And, and his points there are this, that according to God's plan, Jesus Christ was crucified. Um, it, it begins to speak, and, and it's interesting, I don't know if you've caught that, I hope you were paying attention to that, we see both the sovereignty of God and the free will of man introduced here, Right? According to the purpose of God, there in verse 23, him being delivered to the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. Uh, and so he's saying God had this in his plan all the way from the beginning. That This didn't come as a surprise to God. This is not plan B. God didn't say, oh, I wanted Jesus to be the Messiah, but you rejected him as the Messiah and you crucified him. And Well, now that you've crucified him, let's kind of make some good out of that. No, understand all the way from the beginning, this was part of God's plan. But notice that the sovereignty of God does not excuse their free will and their choice who you by your lawless deeds. You are responsible for the choice. If you saw this uh, righteous man and you saw the good works that he did, you knew who he was and you willingly chose to crucify him and you are guilty of that and you will stand before God and answer for that. We, you see, we, we can't say, well, you know, God knows all that's going to go and what's happened, so I'm not responsible for what's going to happen. No. Uh, we're responsible for our choices, even though God in His sovereignty can take our choices and can turn them out for good. And so we here we see the balance of God's sovereignty and human responsibility, that Jesus Christ was crucified. But, right, the good news, the centrality of the Christian message is this, is that death could not hold Him. And again, he goes back to the Scripture. He says there in Psalm 16, he quotes Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. Uh, and you see there uh, that quote of Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. And he highlights the fact that David was acting as a prophet when he said that uh, you would not suffer to see your Holy One to see corruption, nor would you leave his soul in Hades or in death. He says, we know that's not speaking of David, because we can go over to David's tomb right now. I can show you where David's tomb is. And David is still buried in that tomb, and you could probably find his bones there in that tomb. So his body saw corruption, uh, and he remained there dead. As this is speaking of David's seed, right, the Messiah that was to come. This is speaking of David's seed. David was speaking prophetically because Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And he comes back, his body did not see corruption. He was only in the tomb three days uh, he did not remain with the dead, but came back to life under the power of God and was resurrected from the dead. And so he shows the fulfillment of this prophecy of David there in Psalm 16. And then he points out, now he has ascended to heaven where he has assumed authority at the right hand of God that he has been vindicated both to be uh, the and Messiah, Lord and Christ, right? He is the Messiah that was promised. He is the sovereign God of all of the universe as is vindicated by His resurrection and His ascension. He is now seated at the right hand of the Father where He has been given the Holy Spirit whom He has poured out on us all. Uh, there. And in verse 36, He says this, whom you crucified both Lord and Christ, that He is both the Jehovah God 
as well as he is the Messiah that we were waiting for. And the evidence is there in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And these are prophesying or speaking under the power of the Holy Spirit, whom was given by Jesus Christ since he now is seated at the right hand of God and has authority to give out the Holy Spirit. He also reminds us here, right, since Jesus Christ is Lord in Christ, that he will judge the righteous and the wicked. And that all of us will one day stand before Jesus Christ and give answer to him. And so if you look here at this, right, the the message that he's just highlighted is the fact here of this. uh, Yes, it was according to the sovereign hand of God, but you are guilty. It was your lawless hands that crucified this righteous man. And you have guilty of innocent blood who is now vindicated by God and is seated at the right hand of the Father and is going to exercise all of authority. And you're going to one day stand before that holy, righteous God. You'll understand that the result of that was the conviction of the Holy Spirit. So we see thoroughly the success of the ministry that comes from the Holy Spirit. They came under conviction of the Holy Spirit. That that crowd being there, many of them knowing, already having witnessed both the crucifixion and then three days later the resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, there would have been in that crowd those who had consented and conspired together to crucify Jesus Christ because they thought it was politically expedient, as well as they didn't want him to disrupt their life and their system. And now their hearts are smitten with guilt. Now what do they do with that? And it says there, and they said, uh, and when they heard this, they were, verse 37, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Right? When we become aware of our guilt and we feel the weight of that guilt, that's what we often call the conviction of the Holy Spirit. This is oftentimes why people uh, don't want to hear the Scripture being taught and preached. Right? This is why some people don't come to church. Because when they come to church, all of a sudden they begin to feel a little uncomfortable. And uh, I think the preacher is preaching right at me and he must have been like watching what I was doing this week. How did he know that? And and what's going on? Uh, I want you to understand that that's not me. That's the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is moving and working in your life, if you're uncomfortable this morning with the message that's being preached, then what I want to encourage you is don't resist it. Don't sit there and fight it and say, well, you know, we should hurry up. A few more minutes, I'm going to be out of this. We can go to lunch. I just have to put up with this very much longer. Don't resist it. That is a gift that the Holy Spirit is giving to you where he is convicting you of your sin, that he is making you aware of your guilt, and he is drawing you to Jesus Christ. If you experience the conviction of God this morning, don't kick against it. Don't resist it. Surrender and submit because that is good news. God is moving and working in your life. And so they began to come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. They were, understood they were guilty of uh, sin. And so they came to Peter and said, what should we do? What, what do we need to do? Like, you've told us and we understand that you're right. We are guilty. We, we participated and we're part of that. And we understand that, yes, we've seen the evidence that Jesus is who he claimed to be. Uh, so what do we need to do? What, what's our response, right? That's one of the reasons that we give an invitation. At the end of the sermon, we give you an invitation, an opportunity to respond. Here's a, a call to action of what you need to do with this. And that's exactly what Peter says. Verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, and so you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so he says that you're to repent and put your faith in Jesus Christ. We understand this, all right, repentance and faith are often two sides of the same coin. Some people say, well, should we repent or should we believe? Um, Yes. We do both. And both of those are there together, right? It's the idea that we're headed in a direction down one road, right? Uh, And uh, we're headed in the wrong direction. And the Holy Spirit comes to us and he convicts us of our sin. And this is the wrong direction. And instead, you need to go back towards Jesus Christ. And so what do we do? We repent. It's a turning, a changing of our mind, a changing of our direction. And we believe. We begin to go and move in that direction there of Jesus Christ. You can't believe without repenting. You can't repent without believing, right? Right? There are two sides of the same coin, that we 
put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ because we understand that we're guilty of sin, we're insufficient to get to heaven or to God on our own, and that we can only do that through the gift of uh, Jesus Christ. And so when we turn from ourself and from our sin, we turn towards Jesus Christ, and we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, uh, that's repenting and believing. Tragically, some have looked at this passage and said, well, uh, also included in that is you need to be baptized. I, this is ironic, right, because we're Baptists, right? We, we believe in putting people into the waters of baptism. But we understand this, that baptism is not necessary for salvation. But you say, but hold on, he said, be baptized for the remission of sins. And understand this idea of the word for there is on account of, right? Repent of your sins, believe in Jesus Christ, you'll experience the remission or the forgiveness of sins. And now as an outward testimony as an evidence to everyone else, and as a step of faithful obedience to Jesus Christ, you now get baptized. But because you've experienced the forgiveness of sin and the salvation that Jesus Christ offers. So this word for means uh, on account of or on the basis of. It doesn't mean to bring it about. So I, I'm not getting baptized to bring about the remission or the salvation of sins. I'm getting baptized because I have experienced the salvation of sins. Very simple for us to understand, right? Um, this morning, if you were to get a headache this morning, uh, you might go to the medicine cabinet and say, I'm going to take an aspirin for my headache. Now, what you're not saying is, this is a wonderfully good day, and uh, everything is going well. I think I'd really like to disrupt this good day by having a headache, and so I'm going to go take an aspirin so I can have a headache. Right? No, what we're saying is, because I do have a headache, I'm going to the medicine cabinet to take a, an aspirin, two of these, and swallow them with some water, because I already have a headache that I'm hoping and trusting the aspirin will get rid of. And so we can experience baptism for, on account of, the remission of sins. Thirdly, it brings us here, we see the success of the Holy Spirit. The success of the Holy Spirit is this, is because they're now ministering underneath the Holy Spirit's influence and power, they experience success in their ministry. This, every preacher longs for this type of day, right? You go out, you preach the gospel. You have, want somebody who says, what do I need to do? You share with them what they need to do. You give the invitation. And you notice what happens here in verse 40. And many of the other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word and were baptized were about 3,000 souls added that day. If one day, 3,000 people responded to the invitation, trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, and immediately followed the Lord uh, in believer's baptism. 3,000 people in one day. And that's a, what every preacher longs to experience. But any success that we have comes not through our own power, not through our great oratory skills, not through our wonderful use of technology. Any success that we have comes because of the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not us who do, do this. So this is good news for you because right, you might be thinking, well, I, I could never get up there and speak like that. No, well, that's fine. God's not calling you to get up and speak like this. God's calling you to be faithful to serve where he's called you. And so maybe God's just called you to, to teach two or three junior high boys. Maybe God's just called you to be a faithful witness uh, there at your lunch table, as you gather together with your coworkers in your job. God's called you to be faithful where you are, but here's the good news, right? It's not dependent upon your skill and ability. It's not how well, like, you can persuade people and twist their arm and manipulate them into the kingdom of God because, like, I'm really good at arguing. If you're probably really good at arguing, you're probably not trusting on the Holy Spirit. It's our dependence upon the Holy Spirit and the work that He does. Peter was radically changed and transformed. His success in ministry was not because he was one of the better speakers. Like, yeah, there's 12 of us, we can each speak and do a pretty good job. But man, Peter, he is really good. Like, he really keeps the crowd. No, his success in ministry came because the Holy Spirit was given. Prior to that, they'd gotten up and spoken. And they hadn't experienced that, right? Uh, they hadn't experienced that type of success before. Now, all of a sudden, the dramatic change is, very simply, it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowers and enables you for ministry. And, and so if you say, well, I don't think I can do that, you're in a wonderful place. You can't. God can. Trust God and step out and do it. Right? That's what we 
We need to realize ministry is not about us. It's about God. If we're giving the glory to God, God can make that radical change. And so what do we do with what we've heard? There's three things I want to encourage you with. First, if you are here this morning and you're experiencing conviction of sin, we've talked about Jesus Christ being crucified and risen and coming again. You say, I'm not sure I'm ready for that. I, I don't know that I believe who Jesus Christ is. And you're experiencing the conviction of sin. That Very simply, I want to encourage you to repent of your sin and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. To receive his wonderful gift of salvation that he freely offers by faith. If you're experiencing that conviction this morning, understand that is a gift that God is giving to you. Because God is moving, working in your heart, and he is drawing you to himself. Secondly is this, is have you experienced the Holy Spirit's change in character? How could Peter go from being one who denied Christ now to be the one who boldly is proclaiming Jesus Christ here in front of not only uh, just a, a few people you know, there in the, the courts, but he's now proclaiming it to a massive crowd. He could do so because the Holy Spirit changed his character. And that's what the Holy Spirit desires to do for every believer. He wants to change who we are so that we reflect Jesus Christ. We give honor and glory to Jesus Christ. Thirdly, are you serving Jesus Christ? Of the 120, they didn't gather together there in the upper room and say, okay, uh, we're going to nominate a few select few people who are just going to go out and do ministry for us. And we'll be behind them. We'll be encouraging and supporting and cheering them on. We'll be giving financially to them. Uh, but we're going to kind of just sit here and watch them do ministry. Of the 120 that were gathered in the upper room, how many were under the influence of the Holy Spirit? How many were speaking and testifying? Uh, 120. Everyone who is a believer is called to ministry. It's not just a select few people. Every one of us are called to ministry. But here's the good news. The Holy Spirit empowers us and enables us for ministry. And so you've got, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, right, you've received the gift of the Holy Spirit he is enabling you for ministry. You say, I'm not com comfortable with that. That's good. It's not about you. It's about the Holy Spirit. You step out and do the things that you're uncomfortable with, and you watch God show up, and you'll see amazing things take place. 3,000 people trusted Christ as Savior. Uh, man, we, we still, all of our modern technology, all of our larger crowds that we have today, we still long to see that result. Maybe the difference is we're not depending upon the Holy Spirit like they were. But in when we do, and if we do, we can see great things happen. God is calling you to serve. Are you stepping out to serve and to tell others about Jesus Christ? Let's bow down a word of prayer. God, we thank you for the wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit. We know that he is moving and working here in our midst this morning. God, if there's some that are experiencing conviction of sin, they're, they've never trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. God, may this morning be the morning they trust Jesus Christ as Savior. Maybe there's some hidden sin that they're holding on to that you, through the, your Holy Spirit, is just convicting of them and telling them to repent and return to Jesus Christ. God, thank you for that conviction. It's uncomfortable. We often don't enjoy it. And yet, God, we know that it is a wonderful gift that comes from you. God, we thank you for the change that you're bringing about in our hearts and our lives. Help us to become more like Jesus Christ and help us to tell others how good Jesus is. Embolden us for ministry so as we leave this week, we'll boldly go out sharing the good news of Jesus Christ and boldly proclaiming who Jesus Christ is and the difference that he's made here in our life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God's moving in your heart this morning. I'd encourage you to, to take that step of faith and act. And if you do, please let me know so that we can minister, that we can pray with you, we can rejoice with you. And, and so follow up. Give us a call, to, uh, text us, email us. Do something to act, right? They, they came and said, what shall we do? And you'll notice Peter didn't say, oh, look, you're good, just go home. No, he said, here's what you need to do. Take that step of faith. Do something to help to solidify that movement, that work that God's doing there in your heart. Uh, we've mentioned our, our faithfulness and our giving. We're grateful for your faithfulness and your giving and ministry that you've enabled us to do. Uh, when we team together with the work of the Holy Spirit, 
God can do amazing things. And so uh, we're grateful for that. Continue your faithfulness there with that. And then we want to share just a couple of things that are going on for our teenagers. Uh, they're looking at going winter retreat near the week of uh, Valentine's weekend uh, there. And uh, if you're one of those or you know one of those who would like to come, you need to move and to act quickly. Today is the last day that forms are to do. Uh, and so... Uh, you need to turn your forms in and your deposit in there with that. And then uh, every fifth Sunday night, we like to try and do something a little bit different, kind of just some fun ways to help to facilitate uh, fellowship and get to know each other. And so there, January 21st, right, is our next, uh, January 31st, right? So that's, 21st is the wrong date. The 31st is the fifth Sunday. Uh, January 31st is our fifth Sunday night. We are having the great Bible challenge, and uh, you say, what is the great Bible challenge? Because I'm not sure if I want to go out to that or not. Um, I want to encourage you to come out. This will be a great time, just a fun time. We're going to try and do some several different games uh, to study the Bible, to understand the Bible, but also to fellowship and have fun with each other. You can bring your holy competitive side. I don't know if there's a holy versus an unholy competitive side, but you can bring your holy competitive side that you can come out and help to lead your team on to victory, or you might just want to come out and just have fun with each other and just enjoy spending time together with each other. Uh, but we've got uh, five or six different games that we're planning there for that night. Uh, some simple games, some ch more challenging games, uh, g individual games, group games. Uh, but we're going to be playing together as teams, several different teams. And we want to invite you to come back out that night, 6 p.m., uh, just our regular church time, 6 p.m. there on a Sunday evening. Uh, we're going to come out and have the, the great Bible. I, I'm excited about this. I'm looking forward to this. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we're, we'll learn while we're having some fun, but it'll be a great time just to get together. And so we want to invite you to put that there on your calendars. You know, if you use your phones, take your phone out and use that. Put that on your calendars. We'd love to have you come back and to be a part together there of that. As we get ready to dismiss today, I want to leave with, with the blessing that comes from Romans chapter 15. It says this, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And what a blessing that we've been given that wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit who makes a difference there in our life. And so as we leave today, may we go underneath His power today being changed by Him this morning. May God bless you. Thank you for being here. You are dismissed today.